the cloud. All right, there we go. Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, and thank you for coming. We had enormous amount of interest in this workshop. So um, my name is Julie Roth. I am senior energy analyst at the city of Ann Arbor for the Office of Sustainability and Innovations. And we brought this together um, kind of very quickly. Last week, we decided to do this mainly in response to a lot of community uh, conversation that was happening and questions we were getting at the office um, subsequent to the big giant powder out power outages that happened around here. And I, um, the topic of resilience really kind of um, became elevated and uh, more people really thinking about resilience and backup power. And so we kind of scrambled around and said, well, let's have a community conversation and let's get some people who know things into a room and other people who have questions into the same room. <laughs> and so that's what we did. So here you are. And um, I'm gonna continue to let people in as we go, but um, essentially what we're gonna do today is we have um, three different solar and battery installers, contractors here that are gonna take turns talking to you a little bit, uh, all the way from sort of a very brief 101 about batteries and solar and how it all works, all the way through sort of a more technical discussion. And we have um, Thea from our office here, who's gonna talk a little bit about portable battery and solar options. We have two, I think, I saw one of them, one or two homeowners who have uh, batteries and weathered the storm, so to speak. And they're gonna talk about their experiences and we're gonna have plenty of time for questions that everyone has. I'm going to ask that people please use the, um, the uh, chat for questions. I'm going to try to moderate the conversation. Since the meeting is so big, uh, I think it will go better if we try to use the chat instead of um, popping off camera because, uh, it, it might get a little chaotic. <laughs> so um, before I launch, I'm very curious about one thing. I'm gonna launch a little poll. I'm just curious about how many of you currently have solar and are interested in talking about batteries and how many of you don't have solar and are also interested in talking about solar and batteries. So I'll give you just a minute to answer that. Okay, and I'm gonna close it so you guys can all see. I think it'll show it, hopefully. Can you all see that, the poll response? Some people saying no. no, no. Oh, share results, there we go. Now can uh, you see it? <laughs> okay, good. So it looks like about 40% of the people in the meeting have solar and are interested in talking about storage and about 49% don't and then another 12, so it's like a half and half. That are, that are with um, solar and without solar. Thank you, that's really interesting. And then um, my other quick poll question because that I'm very curious about, um, maybe I can't find. <laughs> okay, I'll see if I can figure out that one later. But now you can not see that anymore, correct? Okay, very good. So first off, um, first thing I'm gonna do is introduce, well, I'll introduce, the first um, installer that's gonna talk to us a little bit, um, and that is Matt Cadwell from Sumter Solar. And he's gonna start off. So Matt, I'm gonna go ahead and make you the host. Um, so that you can share your screen and just go ahead and jump in. All right, everybody, evening. I'm Matt Cadwell, I'm the owner of Sumter Solar Services. Let me see if I can do the share screen thing here about that. There we go. Um, yep, so I'm kind of, I'm, I'm first up, so I'm going to go through kind of the basics of batteries, you know, what they do, what they don't do, what, you know, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to batteries, and, um, you know, everybody else will kind of take it from there. Um, so since I'm first up, I'll do kind of all the easy stuff. So um, do, 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 let's see if I can get this to work here. There we go. Just a real quick thing on me. It's got a kind of wordy slide. I'm not going to read it for you folks. You probably all can read. 
Um, but I've been in the solar business for a long time and I started my business um, a little over five years ago, um, um, mostly doing repair work and then we expanded into doing uh, more installation work and, and stuff like that. We've done quite a bit of work with the city of Ann Arbor within the city limits, as well as the greater Washtenaw County area. And um, as you can kind of see, we've done a lot, of, a lot of work with battery systems over the years. And um, like Jeremy, I kind of grew up in the, in the olden days of solar back when we did lead acid and kind of we've been through all that. Um, and, and really think, seeing things change a ton over the years as far as battery technology, solar technology as a whole, and the batteries especially, um, they weren't real feasible until just um, until lithium really came. So, um, so, uh, uh, so looking at batteries, uh, hold on one sec, I gotta let some people in here. Here we go, I wanna do this, okay. I got it. Sorry, I don't host very many meetings, so bear with me, folks. Um, so batteries obviously store energy, just like a lot of other things. Fossil fuels are an energy storage thing. Uh, uranium, you know, there's all types of different things that have stored energy. Um, wood is potential stored energy in it, stuff like that. If you burn it, it come out. And, um, and, 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 you know, our goal is to get it out in a usable form. Batteries obviously release their energy in, a, in the form of electricity, which we can use to run stuff in our house or electric vehicle or power a flashlight or a phone or whatever else, all sorts of useful things. So, um, so kind of, I did this, just this simple slide just shows kind of the whys and why nots of batteries um, before we kind of get a little further into the weeds with stuff. Batteries, they obviously store energy and what we can use during a power outage as we all kind of experienced in the last couple of weeks, including myself. Um, and they provide energy secu security as well. Um, and, and against, you know, potential changes with the electric grid or, you know, just it's hard to know what the future will bring, but it, it brings some more certainty because when the power is stored within your home then you have complete control over that versus power coming from an outside source, a gas station, um, the local utility, stuff like that. You have more limited control over that power source. And uh, generally it's better for the environment. You can um, store solar energy for nighttime use or off, off time use instead of um, buying power from the electric grid during that time. And which I'll go into a little bit more on the next slide. And uh, D, um, DTE and uh, Consumers Energy Now both have a policy where they will purchase excess solar energy from homeowners, but they purchase it back at a lower than retail rate. It's actually about a third of the retail rate, but they happily sell you the power at the full retail rate during, um, during the evening hours. So it's a chance to kind of arbitrage energy a little bit with the batteries, being able to store extra during the day, and then you use it at nighttime. Um, why not? There's definitely some negatives. Obviously, this is not this batteries ain't no panacea. So um, they're fairly expensive. So for a battery that's really going to do something and store a really usable amount of energy, they cost some money. Um, an average home system, it'll add, um, if you do a standalone battery system, or if you have batteries that are with a solar array, both will add, they both will cost about $10,000. So, and there are a little bit of um, some tax credits and stuff that can help offset that. But um, so they're, you know, they're fairly, it's a, it's a definitely a financial commitment. They take up some space in the home and kind of see in the pictures there that kind of get a sense of the size of, uh, of average batteries. Those are both kind of average, um, not very exceptional systems, just to give an idea of the size. Um, if, if they're installed with a solar array, they don't actually save you much money they save you a little bit, so they, but they add a ton of costs, so they do extend the financial payback period a little bit on a solar array if they're installed with that. And, and obviously there are some safety concerns. We've seen things on the news uh, very recently with Chevy Bolt having trouble and, and just different things. Everybody remembers those little um, that segues hoverboards burning up a couple of years ago and stuff like that with some cheap foreign batteries in them and stuff like that. So that that is that is a potential hazard for batteries. Batteries store a lot of energy, just like you know any other um, thing. So potentially, if that energy is released all at once in an uncontrolled manner, it can be it can it can you know create a hazard. So um, go on to my next slide. Oh, give me one sec. Kind of let some more people in here and oh. 
All right, let's see if I can get to my next slide. And uh, I'll do a quick primer on solar. This is definitely not a solar presentation and Julie's gonna cut me off here in a minute anyway, so I gotta kind of keep talking. Um, but just to get an idea, because a lot of people in here either have solar, you probably get some of this already, or if you're thinking about solar and batteries kind of go together like bread and butter a lot of times for most folks. So our company, we have yet to install a battery system without an associated solar array. So we've done solar without batteries, but never vice versa so far. So you could do it. It just um, it just hasn't hasn't come up with us. So it's it's possible though. So um, so on the left, you can see there if you have um, a solar without batteries, kind of a lot going on in this drawing. But basically, the sun shines on the solar panels, creates energy that's put into an inverter box because the energy comes in as DC power. The inverter inverts the power to AC, which is usable in the house, and it goes in through the house, powers all your appliances and lights and stuff like that. If there's extra power, you can sell it. The utility will automatically buy it from you, um, and, and, and it's always arranged. Any installer will set up that arrangement. It's fairly straightforward. And then and during the off times, if solar is not available, you purchase power back from the utility. So the power can flow both ways. All that happens hands off. It's all just automatic. It's pretty pretty straightforward. So, um, and then on the right, you can see if you have solar with a battery system, it adds a little more little more moving parts with that. So um, as you can see, so uh, the solar works the same way. It can power the house during the day. If there's extra power, it can be sold to the utility. The power can be purchased back from the utility at times in, uh, when you don't have enough solar. But now we've added the battery in there. So the battery can act as a fuel source as well, a storage unit, and then we can draw from it when the solar is not enough to run the house. So, so it's very common for overnight loads and uh, or potentially in the winter time and stuff like that. And then the big kicker with batteries is that it can be a backup power source for you. So, so the catch with the solar on the left without a battery, if you don't have a battery, it's a law if your solar if the i'm sorry if the grid goes down if there's a power outage your solar automatically shuts off as well it's a safety feature it's required it's, a, it's this code requirement for everybody everywhere so so that way if the solar's running and the grid's down there could be a line person out there working on those lines and they could get electrocuted from your solar they don't know that there's any power creeping out of your house on those lines and they could get killed so so like I have people ask, I do not have, I have a big solar array at my house, um, like Jeremy and most of us do, but I don't have any battery backup at my home. Uh, my budget committee, my wife uh, um, um, kind of put the kibosh on that. So we don't, we don't have a battery. So when our power goes out, I lose power from my solar as well. So, um, you know, I'm not any, any kind of special just because I work in the business. So, but if I did add a battery bank, then the way it would work is that the system is smart. We had a different inverter box in there and it's a little smarter. So it's able to switch from an on-grid mode to an off-grid or a, like a self-supporting mode. And it cuts, it has a big, they call it a transfer switch and it shuts the grid off during the time of the outage. And then the solar and the battery can power your home independent of the grid during the outage. And it's always looking for the grid as soon as the grid comes back on, it reconnects and resumes normal operation. And that all happens automatically. It's similar. Standby generators work similarly. Natural gas generators work the same way. They're always watching for the grid. As soon as the grid goes down, a big switch is thrown automatically, and the generator starts and powers the home for the duration of the outage. So um, they're both kind of, in a way, they're both, they're both providing backup power for your home. So um, just a different fuel source runs one runs on solar one runs on natural gas or some sort of fossil fuel and it's just my last slide is a couple types of batteries i kind of we didn't have a ton of time for extensive preparation plus i'm not just not that flashy of a guy so i just wanted to run real quick through a couple of common battery technologies most of us are familiar with these alkaline or the old school you know a double A, triple A, C, D batteries that we put into our, uh, you know, flashlights and things like that to run stuff. And, um, and they're non-rechargeable and they're, they're just one use and then they're, they're just tossed. So, and um, they were never used for any kind of large or be exceedingly rare to use them for any kind of larger um, standby power source. 
Now, uh, lead acid batteries, very common. We use them in our cars, obviously, as a starting battery for our cars and boats and whatever kind of stuff like that we have. And um, they work really well. The one catch is with lead acid is that they're, they generally tend to be better for putting out a huge amount of power for a very short time. Like we need to turn over a big V8 engine or some such like that, not to like slowly power our house and stuff. So, um, so they've kind of generally been a poor fit for that. But for many years, that was all we had. So that was the only, that was the only horse in the stable. So that's what we used. And um, you kind of had to really have to baby them along. They can only be discharged so far before you damage them. Um, and they just, they have quite a few different issue, maintenance issues and stuff like that. They work, they store energy and discharge energy, but, um, and they're, then they tend to be fairly expensive. They're not really any cheaper than lithium. So, and then in the last, you know, five or 10 years, lithiums, you know, really hit the market hard and, um, and become attainable for people to get on a larger scale. You know, even just a few years ago, lithium was kind of like, just something that us solar guys would talk about over a beer or something. Wouldn't it be cool if we got a huge lithium battery, huh? And that'd be great to get their hundred grand. Um, but now they're not, you know, um, you know, so, and there's something that we can put in houses and, you know, use to power cars and heck run our lawnmower and all kinds of different things like that. And um, they're, they're pretty good. They're great. Cause we can put a ton of power in a fairly small area compared to like lead acid, you know, they're much lighter relatively and stuff like that. We can discharge them virtually down to zero for thousands of times compared to lead acid, where you can do that for maybe like a couple hundred times before they're toast. Um, so we can use them every day in our house for 10, even longer years, you know, and, and to power our homes. And, um, and there really is, there's always, you know, we always, I, I, you know, I don't want to get into like the news too much, but like in generally the way the news folks work is they're, you know, they're trying to sell a story. And so when we see a uh, burning hoverboard or a laptop going up in smoke or something like that, I always try to remember like that was one laptop out of how many, you know, and it's the same thing. There have been a, several lithium battery, large battery bank fires in the last couple of years. There've been several. Versus there's, you know, thousands and thousands of these systems have been installed. Nobody, I don't know anybody first or even secondhand that's had an issue with them. And we've never had an issue with any of our installs or anything. But, but that being said, there is a lot of potential energy in there. So that, you know, if it is released in an uncontrolled manner, it can create a fire. And, um, but the way the systems do work, because because of the danger, just like when we're, you know, dealing with something that's a gas powered thing or natural gas within our home or anything that has that potential danger, there's several safeguards put in place, not even just one, there's kind of safeguards on the safeguards to really keep us safe. So um, there's several control systems to keep to watch the battery and make sure that it doesn't reach an unsafe state. And then it just always automatically goes to a fail safe mode where the battery will shut itself down for safety. So um, I think that's about all I have. So um, I will turn it back over to Jeremy at this point, I believe. Right? Ah, yeah, I think so. And so um, I am like, there are yeah. questions coming in fast and furious and thank you for that. And I am going to try my best to make sure that we can uh, get to all of the questions. So I'm just going to answer a few that were related to what Matt was talking about. Perfect. And then we'll it gives come me to a Jeremy. Chance to figure out how to give it to Jeremy here. Okay, so. great. Uh, Matt, you, <laughs> you can hold on to Oh, you can hold it, Matt. I think he doesn't need to be host. You can just make me the host if you can figure oh, out how to okay, do that. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, so one thing I would say that was a question that came yeah. in is, can you install a transfer switch without a battery? What what that question means, it, I think, is that, you know, Matt was talking about how, um, oh, and you can stop sharing your screen too, Matt, at some point. Um, uh, what Matt was talking about is that, uh, you know, when, if your if your solar goes out, you can switch to your battery to run your um, your generation. You cannot. You are not allowed to have that transfer switch uh, without a battery. That's called islanding, and um, law in Michigan doesn't allow it. So the only way to use your solar during a power outage is if you have a battery. Otherwise, you can't. It, they for some reason the state law doesn't allow you to what's called island your home which is frustrating. You can theoretically put solar on 
and not have it flow back into the grid, you can do a one-way interconnection. I believe that that's okay. Then you just won't get reimbursement from DTE for any excess generation that you have during the middle of the day. Um, so that answers hopefully that question. Um, there were lots more questions and comments about lithium ion batteries and safety. And I know Jeremy and um, I believe uh, Tara and um, Eric are here and they're, they're probably, they can probably address it better than I can as well. Um, and I think I'm gonna continue and just let Jeremy jump in because I think he's gonna answer a lot of the questions that are already here. And so I, am, I promise I'm collecting your questions and we'll get through them, but Jeremy, go ahead and jump in. Hey, how's it going? So yeah, my name's uh, Jeremy Zinn with Oak Electric Service. A uh, little bit of background, actually, if you can give me a thumbs up, Julie, if you can hear me good. I know earlier it wasn't working. Awesome. Yeah, you sound so, great. Uh, so I've been in the electrical field literally since I was 18 years old. I've been in it for 23 years, if you want to date me. So I've uh, been doing this a long time. And what we got it off initially doing uh, back when I was about 20 years old is I got thrown in to be the uh, literally the guy who installed generators every day, automatic generators, backup power systems. So I uh, got out into that and eventually I, I figured out that, hey, you know, someday generators might become a dinosaur, solar and batteries might take over. So we got in back in 2007 doing solar, um, really before there was even solar in Michigan. I, I kind of like to think that the starting date was 2008. So when net metering was adopted. So to date, uh, we've put in, I, I quit counting a long time ago, probably somewhere between, I'd say, 1,200 to 1,500 systems so far, uh, mostly houses. We don't really do too much commercial work. Uh, but when it comes to the power systems, you know, talk about backup generation. We probably have close to 25,000 backup generators out there. Uh, the reason I talk about that is um, home standby generators, solar and batteries, they really all work together. When I first got into this, I thought, hey, I'm going to someday replace generators. But what I found as I got further and further into this is, you know, there can be a, an actual a nice pairing between all of those. So what I usually recommend when you're doing, uh, if you're going to do a battery system, it might not be a bad idea to consider some type of home standby or maybe even a portable connection. So usually all the battery systems we install are going to have some type of connection for a generator. Why do I recommend that? Well, here in Michigan, we have this thing called winter and winter sometimes can last a long time. Sometimes we can have a foot of snow, 18 inches of snow on top of our solar panels. So a backup generator is not necessarily a bad idea. Also, I like to talk about capacity. What is the battery really gonna last for you? So when you look at your, your typical battery, like for example, I have at my house, I've got 17,000 watts of solar and I have a 36 kilowatt hour battery bank. I also have a 20 kW generator. They all kind of work together. It's an older system. Uh, it's a lead acid system. Uh, lead acid batteries, you know, the way I explain those is they're the cheapest battery, but they're also the most expensive battery. And the reason is they're going to last a lot less than, say, a, a nickel iron battery, which they call the 100 year battery, which I put those in. Nickel iron battery is a pretty exotic battery. It was actually, I believe, it was developed by Thomas Edison. And some of those batteries that he had in his laboratory are still working today. So it's just a different type of technology. But most of the stuff we're using now is uh, lithium based. Um, what we install, we got a lot of different systems. I put in Outback, I put in SMA Sunny Islands, I put in Schneider XW inverters. Uh, I mean, just a multitude. The, the mainstream ones that I'm seeing now, you got Tesla, you got uh, your Generac Power Cell. LG, you got Enphase Ensembles. I mean, there's all these different batteries we can install. A uh, new one that we just took on, which uh, we install exclusively sun power panels. Well, sun power likes to have the entire package. So they worked with uh, Lockheed Martin and actually developed a utility grade battery that they're using all over the world for utility systems. Now they miniaturized that and now we have what's called the sun power sun vault. Um, that particular battery, uh, I hear a lot of the talks about thermal events is what we call them in this industry is uh, when a battery catches fire, uh, lithium ion, you have to run some type of coolant on it. You want to keep that battery cool. You know, as far as the safety of those, I just explained to people, you probably have five gallons of fuel in your garage. That's more dangerous than that battery is. Your gas tank that's sitting in the garage doesn't have management, you know, cooling management, um, overloads on it. So, you know, as far as the safety, if you're using something that's mainstream, that's been tested. Um, I saw one of the questions asked about testing uh, UL9540, I believe is the, uh, the UL listing. 
you want to make sure your batteries have that listing on it. You don't want to be the guinea pig. But uh, the Sun Vault, it doesn't use a lithium ion. It actually uses a uh, lithium iron phosphate. It's kind of nice about those batteries is they don't require any liquid cooling. They're literally cooling themselves with air. So batteries, I saw some questions going around, where do they have to be? Um, batteries, you really want to have them in a climate controlled area. Honestly, most electrical components you have are going to last a lot longer and are going to be a lot better over the long run if they're in a climate controlled area. Uh, batteries here in Michigan, don't really want to have them outside. Not too many of them can, can handle the winters that we can sometimes have. Um, even putting in them a garage, if you have a garage that's well, relatively insulated, uh, it's a heated garage, that's a great spot for batteries. But for the most part, you know, putting them in your, your basement, it's a nice, cool, climate-controlled area for the battery uh, if you got the room for it. As far as putting them in a, an actual living space, keep in mind a lot of these batteries have fans on the, uh, the stuff. So when it's running, you're going to hear some noise. So it's not something you want to have on your bedroom wall or your living room wall. You really want to have that in an area that you're going to kind of dampen that noise down. So yeah, I mean, with batteries, oh, capacity. I want to talk about capacity. That was one thing Julie asked about. So, you know, somebody told me a while back, and I love the way he talked about this. You know, we, we prepare ourselves for issues that may arise. So let's say you have a couple cases of water in your garage. We could kind of look at a battery as the same way. So how long is it going to last? Well, how long is that bottled water going to last for you? It all depends on how you use it. If you take it and give it out to all your friends, well, that bottled water is going to disappear pretty quick. If you use it really just when you need it, it's going to last a long time. It's the same thing with a battery. If you decide, for example, I had a guy that uh, we had a pretty large battery bank in, forgot that his sprinkler system was going to run. So his sprinkler system with his well, it ran for three hours straight during a power outage. Beautiful, watered his lawn, and after about three hours, it killed his batteries. So you want to limit what you're using. It's like when you go to the refrigerator, before you open the door, think about what you want. If you see, if you realize how much energy, and I know this because I have two kids now and I watch them do this. You open up the fridge, you stare in there, you think about what you want to grab, then you grab it, and then maybe five seconds later, you finally close the fridge. In a power outage with batteries, you want to be fast. Think about what you need. Think about what you need to turn on and off. Do you really need to have, you know, the furnace at 70 degrees? Maybe you can dial it back to 60 degrees and you're going to get more runtime out of those batteries. So when it comes to capacity, that's the thing you really got to consider. Um, with batteries, bigger is always better. Um, you know, you can start out with a smaller system in most of these systems now you can add to it. So start out with a little one, test it. Don't wait until you have a power outage to do this. I tell people when they put batteries in, what you want to do is do it once a month, shut your power off to that battery system. Usually batteries are going to run just a few circuits in the house, maybe a dozen of them. Shut off that portion of your house and let it run off the batteries. It's like you're camping for the weekend. Test it. Make sure that you really have the capacity that you need. So what's gonna happen now is let's say it's a Saturday night, you're running on your batteries, you still have utility power. If you finally drain them down to the point where you need to turn the power back on, well, it's easy if the utility's there, you can flip that breaker back on. But if you wait until there's an actual power outage to do this, it's gonna be a bigger headache. So I always tell my customers, please, 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 once a month, three months, six months, whatever you wanna do, test your system. Don't wait until the power outage to test it. And I know we're kind of running short on time, so I'm going to wrap it up right there. <laughs> well, can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Um, so do you um, recommend putting a battery on, uh, you know, people always ask, well, what can a battery, uh, you know, actually do in an outage? Like, what can it power? And, and the answer is it totally depends. It depends on the size of the capacity, the size of your house, what you want to power and how much storage you have in your battery and all of those things. But the question I want to know is, um, can you wire your battery to a critical circuit so that it automatically just powers like the fridge and the heat and a couple lights and won't power your dishwasher, for example? Or do you uh, anticipate user management? So, oh, there's a power outage. I'm on my battery. I better not wash my dishes right now. Or either one. Are they both viable options? 
they're both viable. So a lot of the newer technologies out there, you can actually, there's a, a mobile app that's coming from Home Depot, or Home Depot, <laughs> from uh, Generac. And what Generac can do is you can literally from your phone, you're going to be able to flip on and off devices that are running in your house during a power outage. And it's going to adjust the percentage that you have left. So, but most of the time when I'm putting batteries in, I recommend just doing certain circuits. Um, the reason I'm a fan of that is I can go and I can connect your whole house, but until you learn what the true capacity is of your battery, you're going to drain it down. And you're finally going to learn a lesson that, hey, I can't run all of that stuff at once. So if I limit it to 12 circuits, there's a better chance you're not going to push it too hard. Um, running larger appliances, you know, can you put batteries, can you run an air conditioner with a battery? There are certain models out there that'll do it. With enough money, you can run anything. But is it a good idea? Do you absolutely need to have air conditioning when you're running on your battery? Those are the questions you got to ask yourself because the more things you put on it, the more money it's going to cost you. So great. And I'm seeing, I'm just going to answer this one. It's a um, when you have a power, whoops, where'd it go? When you have a power failure and a battery backup, are your solar panels still powering your home and recharging your battery when the sun is shining during the power failure? In other words, how does your battery get re uh, get recharged in a power outage? The battery goes, the solar goes right to the battery, but not to your home. And if I can add to that too, if it's winter time, I am not a fan of clearing your solar panels off except for one day, and that one day is when there's a power outage. That's the day you need to clear your solar panels off. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. And then let me see if I, if there were any other, um, and I'm going to let, uh, there's, uh, Eric, um, jump in here, but let me see if there were any other quick, I know we're going to be talking about portable and smaller batteries. Um, so I'm going to save those questions. What is the expected lifespan of a battery? When do you expect it to die and need to be replaced? Anyone? Depends on the I'm getting 10 years from Matt. You know, it, it, I think all this stuff is really too new, but I've had some of the manufacturers say anywhere from 15 to 30 years. But it, again, it depends on how many times you cycle it. Some of these mm -hmm. batteries go 8,000 cycles. So Jeez, he's right. It totally depends on the, the chemistry and the cycle. That's put on. Eric, which segues nicely to this is Eric, who is also another battery uh, installer here in Ann Arbor. And Eric, introduce yourself and launch into what you want to add to the conversation. And then we're going to go to Thea. So my name is Eric Roberts. I'm the Tech Ops Manager and Master Electrician of the Green Panel out of Brighton. And as big of a player as Jeremy is, I think I got him by a couple of years. I've been a Master Electrician for 30, and I think it shows. Um, but as big of a player as Jeremy may be in the generator, we are that big in the battery industry. We, uh, we're the number one battery installer in the state. We are the only Tesla authorized and certified dealer distributor in the state of Michigan. And we've installed almost everything that's out there on the market. So our, our experience is through the roof. And um, what you asked me to talk about a little bit is what do you do in the event of no solar on a house? And so a battery can be installed even without solar and it can be charged from the grid and it can be just sitting there as a kind of a, a, a generator itself. And it can sit and wait and it can be programmed to do peak shaving demand rates to be discharged in the house in the event that the utility rates are higher throughout the course of the day, like they are out on the West Coast. And it does not have to be tied in with solar. So a lot of these uh, townhomes and apartments, they can be put in there and they can be used as a backup solution because you can't put a generator in there and it can be used to be cycled. Um, one of the things that it comes with the batteries these days is it's not, it's just as important for the battery technology as it is the software. And one of the major components that's out there is how upgradable the software is, how functional it is and what it can do to your battery um, for now and in the future. And so, um, you know, the, the, the product that we install is also a company that puts the battery out there for the cars. And it's really a big computer on four wheels. And so software is just a huge component. And it just, it allows the Tesla product to be programmed for an off-grid application 
for applications that you are programming to have multi-functions and also for a utility only tied system. So there's a lot of functionality to it. Thanks, Eric. Yes. So batteries for backup power. I mean, most people, when they think about batteries, they're thinking about backup power, but you're also able to use them during the evening, right? To help sort of offset the cost of the battery by using your own electricity that you produce right. during the day and you use it during the evening and it helps. So you don't have to sell it back to DTE at a discounted rate. So that, that sort Absolutely. of- Absolutely. The, the battery was really not designed for how we use it in Michigan, which is to supplement the solar for the net metering. The batteries were really designed to peak shave, like I said, on the West Coast in California, where the rates are astronomical through the course of the day. And so if you look at how the battery has kind of moved from West to East, and you look at who the players are on the West Coast, they, they designed the battery for multifunction. So as we are moving towards the demand charges here in the state through the utility companies, the batteries are gonna become multifunctional. They're not just gonna be a supplement to the solar. They're not gonna be just a battery backup solution. You're gonna be cycling these throughout the course of the day to offset the peak demands in the middle of the day, therefore increasing the payback time and making a much more um, reasonable you know, investment to make along with the solar. Yeah, so what Eric is describing is when, when, the, when there's a lot of peak demand on the grid, in other words, when everybody wants energy all at the same time, which is like, you know, on August at 3 p.m. or something like that, and everyone's running their air, air conditioning, there's this sort of peak demand on the grid. And the power companies um, instead have to then, it, it's very complicated, but essentially DTE and the other big players have to then go purchase power from what are called peaker plants, which is way more expensive than power that they usually purchase from their regular plants. And so it's expensive for the actual distribu distributor, which is DTE, to give you power. So in theory, we should have utilities that are really excited about distributed solar and batteries because it can help shave all that peak energy, but that's not really the business model that they're currently working under. And they are not currently um, in agreement with my, my fabulous, it's not a theory, it's fact. So <laughs> as you know, Julie, Consumers Energy is doing that right now. Not only did they have a rate increase, but from March to October, right in the middle of the day, they have a minimum of five cents a kilowatt hour increase on yeah. the rates. And so that is at a minimum. And that's right. a perfect time to discharge your battery and use right. it with the solar to offset that cost. Right, so. exactly. So I'm gonna ask um, uh, a few questions that I don't know the answer to fully. And then I also wanna bring up Thea. Um, one of the questions, and I knew it was gonna come up and it came up right at the beginning is the Ford F-150. Because we've all heard that the Ford F-150 is coming out and it's gonna be able to work in two directions, right? Be charged as a battery and also discharge to act as a backup. Do anybody, do any of our installers or anybody else have expertise about what exactly that means? Cause I keep hearing sort of vagueness and I don't know if there, if is that gonna work with any inverter? Is it gonna need its own special equipment? Does anyone know anything more specific about the Ford F-150? So I do, Julie, I, first of all, I have a deposit in on one, <laughs> but, what they're promoting is they're promoting a bi-directional inverter type of system where they're going to use the AC from the grid or the solar when needed to charge the vehicle. And in the event of a power outage, they can use the vehicle's battery as something like a, you know, a power wall or something. Now, they still are going to need another piece of equipment that has got to be implemented between the meter and the house panel. And it's going to be like a transfer switch mechanism, like a lot of all the other equipment is. It has not been UL approved. They haven't even designed it. Um, we're, we work very close with Ford Motor Company with their green energy um, initiative. And so we talked to some of the headquarters over there and right now they're just, they don't have an answer for that. Ultimately, I believe it's gonna be coming down the pipeline for 
all of the auto dealers and all the auto manufacturers, but right now it's not we're something not that's, that's functional, no. Yep, that was my understanding too, is we're not quite there. There was also an, a really excellent uh, question from Sophie about islanding and microgridding that I could go on about for hours and hours, but I won't. Um, essentially, and that is that, yes, it is true that islanding and microgridding, microgridding means that, so right now, for those of you who don't know, if I want to install solar on my roof, DTE limits me to install the amount of solar that would offset my usage for one year. So they look at what's one year of Julie's usage and they say, that's how big your solar array can be. And it cannot be one kilowatt more than that because they say, if I have one kilowatt more than that, I'm sort of like my own little utility and they, they, they're not, they don't want that. And they've essentially effectively um, lobbied the legislature to make that law. So I can't, I can only have, I can't have a lot of excess on my roof to power my neighbor. Now, having said that, um, there are times of the day and the year where I'm producing way more solar than I'm using, right? Um, in the middle of a bright sunny day when it's not that hot and I'm not using AC, I'm producing more than I'm using. Even in that case, I can't sort of sell it to my neighbor or use it to flow to my neighbor and offset their electricity bill. Can't do it. They won't allow that. It flows back into the grid. It does go to my neighbor, but DTE pays me back at about half retail rate and then charges my neighbor full retail rate for the, uh, for the, the solar. Um, so essentially what we need are what's called microgrids. And microgrids would be, I have, let's say, a big, giant, sunny, south-facing roof that I could put all the solar I can fit up there. My neighbor with big trees or a weird pitch or something can't really host solar. And so they can basically purchase the excess from me. Uh, in a microgrid kind of situation, not directly from me, but essentially get offset in their bill. Um, or let's say you're in a co-op situation, you could put out a ground mount and that one ground mount can, uh, can then be wired to everybody's individual uh, co-op townhouse and, um, and, and work as like a mini community solar. We can't do that right now because the legislature won't let us and, and the, it's, it's law, state law. So if you're interested in um, lobbying your legislators, <laughs> by all means, uh, let them know that this is, you know, the energy future that you see is not one big conglomerate. It's a lot of small and local microgrid solutions. That is my, that is my little, um, I'll get off my little uh, what it, soapbox. Um, there's a lot of questions here about. Hey, Julie, I want to oh, I want to interrupt if I could real quick. So yeah. the microgrid I think is starting to gain traction, and the reason why I say that is we are working with Consumers Energy out on in Jackson on a project where an apartment complex took 150 kW, and we're applying a 250 kW battery with it in a microgrid type of scenario. And I fully believe that they're using this as a pilot mm -hmm. to see how well it works in a large scale before we get into the small scale area. And so with that being said, just like anything else, I think it's just not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, but they have to get it proven to themselves first. So I think it's making traction, especially if the utility companies can prove that it works and all of a sudden, it, hopefully they'll go through legislature, right? Yeah, so... Um, a couple other things really quickly. I'm seeing, um, I, we have, all right, there's a bunch of more questions, but I also know that we have three other people that I want to get to. Um, and I want to get to Thea, but Devin just told me, Devin Ackman is here. Uh, he's just a resident, not just a resident. He's a fabulous <laughs> resident who um, has solar and battery and has to jump off shortly. So um, Devin, where are you? Oh, there you are. Do you want to jump off mute and talk about your experience with um, solar and storage uh, yeah. from a user perspective? Yeah, happy to. Happy to. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Devin Ackman. I live in the fourth ward here in Ann Arbor over by Dickon. And I start by introducing that because if there's anyone from that neighborhood, you know, we lose power a lot. Uh, in fact, on my street, I would say 75% of the homes probably have um, natural gas backup generators. Uh, we were contemplating this a while back ourselves. 
Um, since that time, my wife and I have decided, you know, not only to go solar, but to try to push forward with complete electrification. In fact, we're looking at geothermal later this summer and, and probably an EV. Um, like some of you perhaps that have solar are considering it, at the time we weren't sure, did we just get the array? Do we want the battery? Um, when we did a little bit of thinking about the cost of a gas generator, natural gas, we just decided it was smarter just to go straight with the solar. There are so many advantages to doing so. Um, since, since that decision, um, we went live, I think, at the end of March with our array. Um, I think we've lost power five times. Obviously, the most recent was the longest. Um, I would say um, we were thrilled. We were up and operational. We were, um, in fact, I don't think I can share my screen, but I'll, nope, I can. I have a quick graphic here. We have the Tesla Powerwall, which is awesome. I can open this app at any, any time. I can always see what we're producing. I can always see where my battery is at. It has a feature called Stormwatch. So if the storm's coming, it pulls data and can it can adjust uh, how much we're pulling from our battery, which is a wonderful feature. So you could prepare in advance for a storm. Um, there's just so many wonderful advantages to having this. And to what was brought up earlier, um, one of the things I love, I mean, all day long when it's sunny, you know, we're grabbing, we're grabbing that, we're filling the battery, and then we're feeding that excess back into the grid. Um, and then we're basically just pulling, pulling that energy. Um, at night, you know, feeding back into our home. So um, that's been really wonderful. According to what we've we've tracked um, since starting in March, we've been producing uh, quite a bit more energy than we are pulling off the grid. So for those of you aiming for net zero, um, the battery is super helpful. Um, ours is in the basement. Like I mentioned, it's a power wall. It's super quiet, no problems whatsoever. Um, in fact, we're trying to figure out how to game this going forward, knowing we're going to have an EV. <laughs> um, so we might consider a more expansive array or additional battery power. Um, aside from that, I mean, yeah, I think it ended up costing, I don't have my numbers in front of me, but somewhere in the vein of like 9,000, I think, for the power wall. Um, if I could go back right now, I would totally do it again. In fact, I have a neighbor who um, doesn't have the power wall. So I think, um, to the point earlier, I think, you know, they were at a different place during these four or five days without um, I, I, the most frustrating thing about the whole thing was having all this extra energy and not being able to share it. So I hate to be selfish, but um, so if I could, um, I, I'll always be happy to answer questions if you want to email me, but um, I'd recommend it in a heartbeat. So that's, that's Evan, our story. I'm curious when, when you had your, this multiple day power outage, what did you power and what didn't you use? And were there limitations on sort of, you know, were you careful? Yeah, we were definitely careful. Um, this was the longest, obviously, but uh, I think the only thing we turned off was um, the AC. So we had the AC off, but um, we would run the dehumidifier. Um, we were just timing it too, because we were producing so much energy during the day. I mean, we switched to a heat pump um, dryer in the basement, but we were still running that in the day. We were running to the dehumidifier because we had some water in our basement. It was just that night we were pulling from the battery we would just flip that off and then kick it back on the next morning. So everything else, the fridge, I mean, I, that's what I'm saying. I felt kind of selfish. We were just powering the whole house like it was a normal day. <laughs> Got it. Thank you, um, yep. Devin. And if there are questions for Devin too, uh, he has to jump soon, but certainly. Um, I'll, uh, drop my, I'll drop my email in the chat. So uh, feel great. free to ping me. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's terrific. I appreciate that. And um, there were definitely some questions about small battery options. So. Um, I know Thea is here and she is going to talk about, cause you, you can get solar on your house and a battery installed in your house. And that's a big investment and not everyone can do it. And not everyone can put solar on their roof and not everyone owns their own roof. And, um, there are options for powering smaller amounts of things with smaller batteries as well. And I, I think to Devin's point, um, it's really important to think about you know, a battery as an option to a generator, right? So if you don't lose that much power, if you really just don't lose power where you are, um, then a battery is a different discussion. But if you're losing power all the time and you're really thinking about buying a big gas generator at a moment in time where investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure is, let's just say, not wise, <laughs> then that's when we're talking about a, a backup storage option that's not a gas generator, right? So it, it, a lot of it depends on whether you lose power a lot or don't and whether and how critical um, it is for you to be able to power through a, um, an outage. But Thea, do you wanna introduce yourself and, and talk a little bit about portable options? They're kind of cool. 
Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Thea. I am an energy analyst with the with Ann Arbor's Office of Sustainability and Innovation, but I'm here more as a resident and just of my experience when I lose power. Um, I'm more of just like a minimalist in general. I've rented for most of my life um, and I'm, I'm pretty outdoorsy. So the battery system that I have set up is actually something that we originally got to go camping. Um, to power things like a GPS or a cameras or our phones. Um, but we quickly learned that that serves dual purpose when the power goes out and you have a charged battery sitting around. It's really, really nice to have a little bit of electricity. Um, the Ann Arbor, we also operated a relief center um, during the four day power outage. And most people came in just to charge their phone. And so I know it's probably beautiful having AC on and your fridge running and all your lights on, but I think there's also necessities that we really, really need. And so if you're at that level where you're like, I needed some phone charging, it'd be great to run a light. I have a CPAP machine I need to run. Maybe you have like a small fridge you're looking to run with some essential medicine. You know, you can scale your solution to what you're looking for. Um, so my solution is the definition of portable. This is like a, um, it's a, it's a 150. So I think it's a little bit more than 150 uh, watt hours. It's 12 pounds. It's a little old. So I think it's actually still a lead acid battery. Although it's a lot more lithium options now that are probably a bit hardier. Um, and on this bad boy, we get about like 10 phone charges and a couple of laptop tablet charges. Um, and then something that I do in my personal life is we have like a bit of an adventure vehicle set up. Um, and so we actually like use this on the road. So we have a solar panel on our car roof that we have set up to a rack and that will like charge this over the day. Um, so it's great. There's three ways you can charge it, you know, either through a solar panel, just plugged into your wall um, or uh, getting an adapter to charge, charge it from your car if you are driving, um, which is also like, I don't know, maybe kind of a bad generator backup, but also kind of like a nice thing to know that you can maybe drive a couple miles and get some charge going on. Um, and so we bought this initially just for like adventuring, powering small vehicles or small electronics. Um, but it really served as a pinch. Um, so I really just have this as an example. Personally, after this four day power outage, I wished I had a bit of a larger battery um, so I could like run a laptop more consistently or, or power a few things off of it. Um, but some tips that I have is that a lot of these brands have like full ecosystems. And so you don't need to have like an electrical engineering degree to figure out what you need, which for me is pretty empowering. Um, so the battery I have now, it's really clear on their website. If you pair with solar panels, how long it'll take to charge, you can kind of scale things to both your budget and how much you think you'll be relying on solar. If you want solar at all, like I mentioned, it has that like integration with your car if you're interested, but it also has a home integration kit. So if you are interested in running a few, um, essential circuits, you can get an electrician to set up the ability to, to plug your battery you know, into your panel, run a few essential circuits if you have a size of, of battery that makes the most sense for you. And then if you still want to double use your battery for, you know, taking on a trip with your kids or maybe you need to take it to somebody else's house and, and share some power with them, you can have a fully um, portable solution that's not like, you know, and in literally installed into your wall. Um, so that's just my take on it. That's my experience. I, I really just like the, the possibility of, you know, putting together my own system that worked. And then you can scale things to both. If you can calculate out how much energy you think you really need emergency wise and your budget, you can find a solution that probably look, works for you. And you don't need to own your home. I don't know, it was a great solution for me. I just wanted to share that um, it's a, a smaller budget step if you're still looking for some resilience. Yeah, I love that. Um, quick question. And I was answering questions on chat at the same time as listening, but. I don't know if you mentioned, but do you have a portable solar panel, like a little solar panel that you unfold and- I do, I have, I have two of them. So this is like one, I truly take like backpacking. So it's like a really lightweight foldable one. Um, and if I could show my screen, I'd, I'd show you quickly, but I think it's too much time. We also have like a hundred watt solar panel affixed on our car roof. So we just like plug this in outside and let it charge during the day. Um, so- Perfect. Yeah, yeah, you can look you can look online and there are all different kinds of 
um, sizes of batteries and little portable folding or not folding different levels of um, solar arrays, not solar arrays, just panels that you can set up and charge your, uh, charge your battery. And like, like Thea said, run some things. Maybe you've got a mini fridge that uh, you really need to keep some things cold, that kind of thing. So I think it's a really cool option. And I'm really glad that Thea has some personal experience with it because um, I don't. And it's nice to have somebody who's here with personal experience. And if you have questions for Thea, maybe Thea can start looking at the chat too and, um, and kind of answer things in the chat because the number of questions that are coming through is so fun. Um, so I'm going to answer a few more questions and then I'm going to go to, um, <laughs> to, uh, Dan, who's here with us too, but a couple of the questions that have come, come in that I can answer. Um, someone asked if, if, uh, solar needs to be connected to DTE in order for the tax credits. No, you can get the tax credits. Um, there's a 26% federal tax credit right now that goes through this year and next year, and then it starts to decline and go away. And that is just for solar and solar plus storage also counts. If you get solar and a battery, it qualifies for that 26% federal tax credit. Some of you may know, and some of you have participated in the Solarize program, which is what a uh, program I run here at the city that helps people come together to do group buys and also get more, di more discounts on uh, solar, which is up to 15%, depending on the size of the group. So that's another thing, if you're interested, you can email me about. Um, there were questions about, um, oh, whether you can, uh, whether DTE will enable you to add solar panels if you increase your electric load in the future. And the answer to that is yes. So if you get a certain solar array and you know that your future is going to include more electrification and you're going to get an electric vehicle or like Devin, you're going to move towards electrification of your heating system and things like that then uh, just you would talk to your solar installer about the fact that you're planning this kind of thing and make sure that the array can be added to both in terms of like the placement of the panels and maybe the size of the inverters and things like that, just so that they know kind of what your plan is for the future. So it is, it is kind of a modular system that you can add to. Um, let's see, so we got those, oh, um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to ethical sourcing of batteries and also disposal of batteries, because these are lots of questions in that. But first I want to go so that our installers can think about those questions, but I want to, um, where did Dan go? Oh, here's Dan Ezekiel, who also has a battery and he was going to talk about how it went for him in the power outage. Okay. Um, hi. Hi. Am I going to be able to share my screen? I can make you. Yep. I'll, I will make you a... I'm going to make you the host, which is what I have to do. And then you're going to have to make me a host after I can figure out how to do this. Give me okay. a second. While you're doing that, I'll just talk. Um, I live on the old west side of Ann Arbor in, in an older home uh, where we've lived for a long time. Matt Cadwell installed solar on our house last year, which came into effect in February. We Luckily, we've had very few power outages around here, but strangely, we've had two since the solar came online six months ago. The first was just for about 45 minutes and it was during the daytime and uh, the power went out and then two seconds later, I saw the lights come on. I happened to be on one of the circuits that the battery runs where I, in the room where I was at the time. And uh, then I went and looked around and my whole rest of my street was out of power. So I knew that the battery would work in this situation. That was a brief uh, power outage. We, we have 11 panels. It's a pretty small system. We don't use that much electricity. And then we have a 10 kilowatt hour uh, LG battery. Uh, I just want to show you a couple of things here. And then I'll talk about this big power outage that we just had. Um, I'm new enough to the solar world that I'm still thrilled about this. Can you, can you see this? Okay, it might be too small for you to see, but this is our, our DTE bill from last month and the gas is 1854 and the electricity is 1224 and we have a balance of $25 in the bank for some month when we, when we need it. Um, and then here's the comparison 
between when we didn't have solar, that same billing period was $107 and uh, this year was $31. So like I say, I'm still so new to this that that's still thrilling to me when I get those, uh, when I get those bills. I wanna show you this. No, oh, not that, this. So we don't have as cool of an app as, uh, as Tesla, but we do have a cool app. It's called Solar Edge. And this is the day of power outage, uh, whatever, August 15th. Um, and uh, at the beginning of this day at midnight, we already didn't have power. So we're just on the circuits that the battery is running. So Matt said we could have seven circuits on the battery. So I just chose the things that I thought were essential. I put the, I put the furnace and the hot water heater on because it's always worried me ever since we got a furnace and a hot water heater that had electronic ignition because they wouldn't run in a power outage. In the past, we would have had a pilot light and the furnace would have worked fine in a power outage. So that always concerned me. And then we put Wi-Fi and we have a chest freezer and we put the fridge on and a couple other things I don't remember what. So the blue is our usage puttering along off the battery. The green is the, sorry, let me this. the green is the solar panels starting to work in the morning. And the fun thing about this is that we were on vacation. We were in a condo up north. And the lady that was taking care of our cat told us that the power was out. And um, I said, I think the solar is going to take care of it. But I asked the lady that was feeding the cat, please unplug the dehumidifier, because I knew that was on a circuit that would be running from the battery. And that's a big energy pig. Uh, so then, the, you know, so I was watching this from up north, kind of interested. And one thing I noticed was it was a beautiful sunny day and the battery was charging up fast, you know, much more than the house was using. And I thought, there's no place to dump the excess if the battery gets up to 100% charge. So what's going to happen then? Well, what happened, you can see, is that right here, the battery got charged all the way and the panels just shut themselves off. Uh, which is which is great, and then uh, the red here is when the when the grid power came back onto the house because some of the circuits in our house are not run by the battery, so something was running uh, that needed the grid, so it came on and we we, we had a little bit of extra uh, use off the grid. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I'm so glad we. I'm so glad. I'm so glad we put in the battery, uh, and it's already it's already proved its worth in two ways. One is that it gives us back our own electricity that we generated at night, so that we're not uh, paying the uh, high rate that Detroit Edison wants to charge us for their electricity at night. And the other thing is that it helps out. Uh, it has helped out in power outages. That's all I got. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. If you want to stop sharing and make me the host again, that would be fantastic. And I'm going to um, launch some of these questions um, also um, to anybody, all of you. And actually, Wayne Appleyard, I think you're here. Here's a question that maybe somebody or maybe Wayne could answer. Somebody asked about a tiny battery, which <laughs> is kind of like a tiny house, I guess, um, like Theo was talking about. Can you use a tiny battery with your solar rooftop and use a transfer switch? Or does that have to be a big battery like a Tesla or an LG Chem attached to your wall? It would have to be a larger battery. Thank you. That's what I assumed, but I didn't want to answer it without knowing for sure. Um, you, you can get a little portable solar to go with the battery and you just yep. put that out on the back lawn and, and it'll charge it. Exactly, yeah. And that it works portable. really well. It, it does work really well, they're very cool. And you see more people using them camping now, but there's no reason you can't just have it in your backyard too. Um, and then, um, okay, lots of questions right at the beginning about end of life, recycling batteries, um, things like that. Do, does someone wanna take on that? question i can if nobody if matt or jeremy or yeah I can, I can jump in um 
Yeah. So as far as end of life recycling of batteries, there definitely is some out there like lead acid. Uh, if, if, if anybody's familiar, they are a hundred percent recyclable in there. And like, I forget something like some astoundingly high rate of those are recycled because um, lead's very valuable um, as a, as a recycle. And it's really easy to recycle. Lithium batteries are trickier because just because of the way they're assembled, the value of the materials is relatively high. Lithium's a, obviously a finite element resource. You know, you can't make more of it. We got what we got. Um, so, people, you know, definitely there's a lot of big incentive to recover that material from batteries. Um, however, what it is, is we've seen the same thing with solar, um, like lithium or batteries, we feel like are kind of following solar, um, where at the beginning solar was made, it was born and made, and we had solar panels, but none of them were broke yet. So you didn't need to recycle anything because there was none to throw away, really, you know, maybe some manufacturing waste a little bit, but that was it. They were all in use. And, 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 and then finally, now we're starting to get to where some are hitting end of life and some more, more and more recycling programs have been set up since then. Um, and well, we've kind of seen the same thing with lithium batteries. They're relatively so new. Obviously, we've had them in our phones and stuff for a while, but the amount of e-waste that comes out of a phone battery compared to like one Tesla battery, the scale is completely different. Um, and so there's been, you know, kind of more limited demand with small devices. There is some programs in place. When you come to the big batteries, they're just, for, it's a good thing. Um, they, they haven't really been around long enough, though, to start breaking to have create enough demand for a, a recycling, you know, system. You're not going to set up a huge recycling facility for like 10 batteries a month or something. You need to have a real you know, material flow. But uh, the good news is there's that economic, you know, the power of economics, there's that incentive because they're so valuable to recover the materials, we feel like you probably won't even, I'm hope, my hope is that a government doesn't even have to step in with some sort of a, you know, a, a, you know, deposit or something like you have on pop cans to get people to recycle them. They'll just be so relatively valuable that just they will automatically get the bulk of them will get recycled because they're still relative, you know, worth quite a bit of money. So that's my two cents. Anybody else want to jump in about battery recycling? Nada. Very good. And then um, there was a question, there are a couple of uh, very specific questions that, um, that something I don't know about. It says ego power stations that hold four batteries. Um, I don't know what that is. Does anyone know what that is? EGO, ego power stations that hold four batteries? maybe not so the very specific questions like that so i think that all uh matt and uh eric and jeremy who were oh ego is a lawnmower thanks <laughs> i don't know <laughs> sorry this is not something i know about but you can answer in the chat if you know about what what this uh if you haven't answered that question by all means i th also think that um I hope that there's a way for me to save this chat. That's what I was just gonna say, because this is, looks like a very useful chat. There's just a ton of information going on here. So I'm gonna see if I, there's a way for, I can um, save the chat before I end the meeting so that I can also include that. I'm going to send out a link to the recording of this meeting and the chat. And um, Matt and Jeremy and Eric have all put their contact information in there and I, think maybe um, some of the, maybe Thea and um, Dan and Devin might have put their emails in there if you have questions for people who have used batteries, or have used, not used batteries, have used themselves used batteries. Um, there was one last question that I wanted to make sure that we got to, and that was, um, what do we think about, um, is there going to be a, some, new technology or a significant reduction in cost in batteries in the very near future. In other words, if you're thinking about getting a battery and you're waffling about it, and maybe you're not losing power that much, so you're not in urgent need of a generator, but you're just like, well, if I wait five years, will this be way better in terms of cost or technology? Um, I don't know, Eric, do you have a thought about that? I don't So, you know, the market is going to make sure that the lithium ion batteries are going to obviously evolve beyond the lithium and the nickel. And so nickel is like the major component in the lithium ion battery. 
I think we're going to go to lithium, lithium iron phosphate. I think we're going to go to batteries that you get a lot more bang for your buck and use less lithium and more of the other more bountiful resources. Um, I know that there were batteries out there that they tried to use salt water. They tried to use everything under the sun to make batteries. As the batteries become more powerful with less, um, I believe they're gonna start using other natural resources that are more bound, right? But it's gonna be an economy of scale. It's what can you make? And I remember even five, seven years ago, if you had told me that lithium ion batteries were gonna be working with solar to feed a house, I would have told you you're nuts. And now they're taking the lead and solar is almost a supplement to the battery because of the because of the technology and the price and everything coming down on it. So, you know, I, I don't know what's next. I mean, you could, you could get in these chat rooms, you'll hear 20 different ideas of what is next. But, you know, until I see it hit the market, until I see it hit the market and make it for two years, then to me, it's just a lot of talk. <laughs> yeah, good. It's, they're tricky questions. Things, technology is moving quickly for sure. Um, I know when it comes to solar, my opinion is that um, with solar particularly, we don't, you know, that there's got to be a, there's a sweet spot, right, in the world where um, technology and costs and climate change and your own personal situation all kind of come together into a, a, a moment where I, I felt like it was time to, to go. And, you know, will they be cheaper in five years? Maybe, but I don't, I didn't feel personally like I could wait another five years um, because the cost has come down a lot and because uh, climate change isn't going to wait. And so again, with a battery, I felt like if I was going to be investing in a generator, for backup power, that's when I would be seriously right now, if I'm about to buy a generator, um, thinking strongly about a cleaner option, which would be a battery. Um, and if you can't do a whole solar array and battery because you're a renter or you, can't, you just can't go that big, um, then I would be looking at what do I really need to power in a power outage? Do I really need to run my entire, you know, however many square foot house, um, as though nothing changed <laughs> in a power outage, you know, great if I can. And, but, um, you know, if I don't have to invest in fossil fuel infrastructure, and if I don't have to burn fossil fuels, and I can get by in those days with critical load or with, you know, powering my devices and maybe, um, you know, a mini fridge or something along those lines, that, that would be my choice. Um, it, because again, it's a juxtaposition of where we are technology-wise, where we are cost-wise, and where we are in, in climate change. Um, and will it be better in 10 years? Probably. Will climate change be worse in 10 years? Well, yeah, <laughs> fortunately. Um, so I think I've seen kind of a, a calming in the chat, which is amazing because that was like one of the busiest chats I have ever seen, which was really exciting. And I am so grateful to all of you for being here. Like I said, we kind of put this together and invited people to come here and share experiences and answer questions as best we could to respond to the community um, and the conversation that was starting to come up after those outages that were so powerful. So um, I think we've done pretty well on um, time. Oh, we have a quick question here. Yes. What about installing a battery ready solar system now and waiting to add the batteries to later? Absolutely doable. Yep, you can install um, a solar system and make sure your inverter is battery capable and install batteries later. That is a very useful thing. So anyway, I, thank you everybody for coming. If you have additional questions, you know, you can always um, contact me. If I can't answer your questions, I will try and get you in touch with somebody who can answer your questions. Um, and uh, I, like I said, I appreciate everybody. I hope this was valuable to you. I would love any feedback. Also, if you want to give me feedback, yes, this was valuable. Please do more meetings to tell us about things or, um, or uh, critical feedback is also welcome. Always. Uh, we're trying to grow and learn and, and do what's best for our community. So with that, have a great rest of your evening and thank you to all of the people who came on very short notice to share your experiences, installers, residents, everybody. I appreciate you. 
So thanks everyone. Thank you, Julie, appreciate it. <laughs> Bye all. Julie, do you see how to share the chat? No, but I'm going to, let's see. If you're the host, it should save automatically to your computer.